Get ready to rumble. Chilling Show Unleashed on the Seven Thunders Media Network. Former city councilor, husband, father, and community watchdog. Your host, Rob Schilling. Welcome to the Shilling Show Unleashed podcast. Remember, your direct support makes our show possible, and you can directly support this podcast by visiting shillingshow.com and then clicking on the Patreon banner at the top of the page to make a monthly contribution. We appreciate your support. The Shilling Show Unleashed podcast welcomes Chris Shemelinski, Vice President at Numbers USA, today with an immigration update. There's lots going on. And Chris, thanks for joining us today on the Shilling Show Unleashed. Thank you for having me. Would you tell us a little bit about the organization Numbers USA? We're the nation's largest grassroots immigration reduction organization trying to fight for immigration policies that would serve in the national interest. And we've got about two to three million grassroots activists spread out across the country. And we help them connect with their members of Congress and urge them to work on legislation that, again, we believe would serve the national interest. Let's talk about the very latest immigration numbers. You keep very careful track of the trends And what do we see happening? The last time I heard it wasn't good news. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the focus, obviously, is is on what's happening down on the southern border. Um, The the federal government, to to no one's surprise, is usually pretty slow in releasing data on legal immigration, which is a significant portion of our work. Uh, What we emphasize on is the legal paths to immigration here in the United States. We haven't seen those numbers, but those numbers have averaged around 1.1 million for the last decade or so. Uh, Again, which, as I mentioned earlier, is a historical high. But again, the focus is on what's happening at the border. And certainly, uh, I don't think it would be a stretch to call what's happening down there a disaster right now. We've had more than 2 million apprehensions along the southern border over the last 18 months or so. Uh, Again, an apprehension is, is an individual or a family unit that's apprehended by Border Patrol. And in many cases, what happens is those Those folks are being caught and then released into the United States and a lot of times with work permits. And once they're released into the United States, pretty certain that they're probably not going to leave, which means that even though we have 1.1 million coming through the legal channels, looks like we're going to have about another million to million and a half coming through through the illegal channels that are just simply going to get paroled by the by the current administration. Isn't that problematic? I mean, you mentioned the focus on legal immigration, but but for people, Chris, who are following the rules to see a whole group of people who just crash the gate and get seemingly rewarded for it seems to break the system in a very bad way. It really does, which which begs the question, is the Biden administration doing this purposely? You may remember right around the time that President Biden was inaugurated back in January of of 2021, he released an immigration plan, which then was turned into legislation introduced by Senator Martinez in the U.S. Senate called the U.S. Citizenship Act. And that would greatly expand legal immigration channels. And you have to wonder, is the administration doing this purposely to just break the system and have complete chaos to try to encourage lawmakers to come to the table and pass some sort of an immigration reform? That's just one possible motive behind what could be happening down on the southern border. But, but you know, to your point, I'm hearing stories a lot about people that are trying to come in the right way through the legal channels. And they've got, they've got a three, four-year wait before they can get in simply because of the paperwork not being processed by U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services because they're dealing with all the people coming across the border illegally. It certainly seems, at least for now, that if you want to get to the United States, the fastest route is to cross the border illegally even if you are, let's say, a spouse of a U.S. citizen who sh- and, and that individual should be getting a green card immediately, trying to do it the right way. But instead, they're being put in the backlog because of what's happening on the border right now. So can we maintain a sovereign nation if we have no, uh, in essence, no border control? Yeah, I, I don't believe we can. And I, and I, and I think that's I want I don't want to throw a blanket statement on the entire Democratic Party because I don't think the entire Democratic Party wants a nationless state. But I do think there are some far left extremists who do. They just simply oppose 
They just simply oppose national borders. And and not only do they oppose national borders, but they also look at it from a social justice point of view, uh, where they say we're we're a rich, very fortunate country. And the people that are coming across the border are are a less fortunate, poor group of people. And and we can just spread the wealth around to all of those folks. Just the world's poor would all come to the United States. And fortunately, you know, the the most recent World Bank data that was that was released just a couple of days ago found that you know population is still increasing here here in the world globally you know there's eight nine billion people living in the world so they can't all come and live here in the united states let's talk about a, a really disturbing story that you're featuring right now at numbers usa and this is uh, immigration benefits of some sort going to terrorists or terrorist supporting individuals and i want to start with the purpose of immigration controls and enforcement it may seem obvious to people but why do we have that in the first place what is the goal if you go back to 9-11, um, everybody remembers that that horrific day. And one of the key factors, the 9-11 hijackers, several of them, well, all of them came here through our immigration policies. And several of them have overstayed visas, so they were here in the United States illegally. So one of the recommendations of the 9-11 Commission was to shift immigration control, which at that time was under the Department of the Department of Justice, to the newly created Department of Homeland Security. And what they did was they tweaked the mission. They adjusted the mission of both Customs and Border Protection as well as U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, which is the agency charged with giving out green cards and and work visas and other visas to, to folks coming to the United States. And what they decided or what they determined was these people are actually on the front lines of national security and public safety. They're simply not just you know, providing a service, making sure nobody crosses the border illegally and or handing out visas. Foreign guests can go vacation down at Disney World. So they're actually serving a meaningful purpose. And that is, again, frontline defense for our national security and our public safety. And you're seeing that all break down right now. And, and you mentioned the terrorist situation. What's happening is we now know the administration has testified under oath before Congress that people on the known terrorist list have been apprehended coming across the border, and some of them have been released here into the United States. And once they're released, again, because the Biden administration is paroling many of these folks, they then become eligible to get work permits, they can get jobs and live and work here in the United States. So it's, it's quite a scary situation now. The administration assures us that they have tabs on all of the folks who are on the known terrorist list who have snuck across the border and been apprehended. At the same time, when you look at their handling of border, the, the, the southern border right now, it, it, it kind of begs the question, do they really have a full grasp on where these individuals happen to be spread throughout the United States? So there have been some very specific changes to the Immigration and Nationality Act uh, from the State Department, the Homeland Security Department. Uh, what did they change and why? So if you go back to the original Immigration and Nationality Act, essentially what they wanted to do was change it up from the original legislation the original immigration policy that was put into place in the 1920s that was discriminatory towards individuals from countries that didn't have a fair representation here in the United States, specifically Central America and South Americans. They wanted to open it up a little bit more to Western how to hemisphere foreign citizens. What they did was they tweaked it and they turned it to this numerical system uh, where we would have family-based immigration and we would have employment-based immigration, but the numbers were all capped. But then they threw the doors open in 1990. But the other thing that they did, which was very dangerous, was they gave the administration incredible prosecutorial discretional, discretionary powers. Essentially, this is, again, what you're seeing on the southern border is people are coming across the border illegally. And the administration is choosing because they are they are using prosecutorial discretion and prioritizing the biggest threats to the United States. Uh, what they're doing is they're allowing all these other folks to stay here to, to come in and stay illegally. Uh, what it also means is the current illegal alien population, which the last time we saw an estimate, which several years ago, which had it tabbed around 12 million individuals here in the United States, they are basically all free from enforcement because, again, through the use of prosecutorial discretion, the, the, the administration is saying we're only going to re- remove the absolute most dangerous individuals who are present here in the United States. 
part of this, that there was a stated purpose of this was that it was meant to help Afghans to come into the country uh, with with less right. with less problem. And I wanted to ask you about the vetting process in the first place, because I've heard a lot of people express skepticism over the vetting of Afghans coming here to the United States. Everybody kind of remembers the chaos from last summer when uh, when when the U.S. tried to quickly evacuate from Afghanistan and, and you literally had Afghanis jumping onto planes that were on the tarmac getting ready for takeoff. So these people were desperate to get out of the country, and a lot of them did get on the planes. Now, they didn't vet them as they were getting on the plane. They just let anybody on the plane, and then they flew them here to the United States, in many cases, an airport in northern Virginia, Dulles International Airport, and a couple other airports throughout the country. Then once they got there, they did very, very light screen before they eventually released them. Some of them they held, and some of the ones that they did hold just simply walked out and left. The people weren't fully vetted, and you also have to remember that in order to fully vet an individual who's from a foreign country trying to come to the United States, you need some sort of cooperation from that foreign government. For example, if somebody from Germany were to try to come to the United States and we wanted to try to do a full-blown background check on them, we contact the police authorities in Germany and, and, and have their equivalent of the FBI and have a background check run on those individuals. But when you're talking about an Af- in Afghanistan that was being taken over by the Taliban at the time, and we were hostile to the Taliban, and the Taliban was hostile to us, there wasn't a whole lot of information sharing between the two governments at that time. So there was no way. So even though the government... The, the U.S. government claimed that they were vetting these individuals coming over from Afghanistan. They could only vet them to a certain point because the data just simply wasn't available to them to do the full background checks, criminal, terrorist, all the different background checks that are truly necessary to protect protect the homeland. Why would we risk our homeland security? And, and particularly, why would the Homeland Security Department risk our homeland security? There, there must be something else there. And there was some talk that maybe this was a concession to Iran. It probably was a little bit of a concession. It was a foreign policy decision. And, and again, I think the Biden administration, as did as did the Trump administration prior to that, it it doesn't matter whether it's a Republic, uh, administration or a Republican Democratic administration. They feel some moral responsibility that when you have a situation like what you had in Afghanistan, the United States has a moral responsibility, especially because we were the ones who had an occupation there to help some of those folks get out of there. And that meant bringing them to the United States. Same situation with the Russia, the, the Russian-Ukrainian war. Uh, you know, I think there was a feeling of, of moral responsibility that we had to help the Ukrainians who were fleeing Ukraine to come to the United States. Thankfully, though, our European partners have been willing to absorb most of them. We used to have a threat level, a terrorism threat level, and it seems that that's gone away. It was a color-coded system. And uh, these days right. we don't we don't hear much talk about terrorist threats. But you mentioned early on, Chris, that we have apprehended terrorists coming across the border. There's no reason to believe that we don't have cells here or that many are making it past our security. It's not too long ago that several years ago now, but it's not too long ago that we forget. I think it was about five years ago mm-hmm. where we had an individual in New York City who 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 was here on an expired visa uh, with some connections to terrorist groups who, you know, drove his drove his truck down a down a bike path and 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 injured a number of people there are there's definitely still a terrorism threat uh, i i think as a nation we've let down our guard since 9 11. unfortunately that's what also led to a 9 11 event because we let down our guard too too much the one thing the one saving grace that i will mention is that i've uh, you know over the 14 years working on this issue i've had the opportunity to meet a lot of a lot of people who work at the Department of Homeland Security, and they are truly these are the career professionals. These are the people that are not appointed by by the current administration or past administration. These are people that work there full time. They are in career positions. They are truly dedicated to protecting the homeland and doing everything they can to make sure that nothing happens. But again, you are increasing the threat when you have 50 individuals cross the border illegally who are on a terror list and get released into the United States. The Ceiling Show Unleashed podcast continues with Chris Shemlinski in just a moment. Online at ceilingshow.com. 
BorderHawk.News is a one-stop shop with the latest news about immigration, nationalism, and globalism. The BorderHawk staff daily curates immigration news stories and in the fashion of the Drudge Report, updates the site with cutting-edge content and original first-class commentary. BorderHawk.News highlights national and international media reports, tweets, and nuggets buried in local news blurbs, polls, video clips, and policy research. Border Hawk is pro-legal immigration, pro-rule of law, but against an unsecure border as countless Americans have suffered violence at the hands of criminal illegal aliens. And an increasing number of Americans are concerned about how mass migration affects their daily life. Borderhawk.news will remain on the forefront of the immigration issue with a buffet of info to read, evaluate, and share. Bookmark Borderhawk.news. Add them on social media at Borderhawk News on Twitter. We return now with Chris Chemolensky, Vice President at Numbers USA. And I want to switch, Chris, to the latest Supreme Court ruling, anticipating something favorable and didn't come back that way. This was Biden v. Texas and uh, having to do with Remain in Mexico. Could you give us a little background? In 2019, we had a similar border surge that we're seeing today under the Trump administration. The difference being is this border surge This border crisis has now been going on for about 15 months, where under the Trump administration, it was only a short, it was only a couple of months, and the numbers weren't nearly as high. I think there were only two months where apprehensions exceeded 100,000, where now we see apprehensions routinely over 200,000 along the southern border in a month, in an individual month. But one of the actions that the Trump administration took Most of these people that are crossing the border illegally and are being apprehended are using a loophole within our asylum law. So our asylum law is it's actually pretty straightforward, but the process is somewhat complex. In order to claim asylum here in the United States, you have to go before an immigration judge and argue your claim for asylum. And the burden of proof is actually on the asylum seeker, not on the United States, to prove that you are not eligible for asylum. But in order to get into that process, there's something called a credible fear interview. And during that credible fear interview, all you really need to say is, I fear for my life if I'm sent back to my home country. And boom, you get through the credible fear interview. And that's what a lot of these illegal migrants who are being apprehended crossing the border are doing. They're passing that that credible fear test that then puts them into the asylum queue. The asylum queue has a massive backlog. It's about a three to four year wait. And during that period of time, the administrations just release them into the United States and hope that they show up for their court hearing several years from now. The Trump administration caught on to this. And what they did was they implemented the migrant protection protocols, otherwise known as the Remain in Mexico policy, which said that if you're apprehended crossing the border illegally and then put in a defensive claim of asylum and you pass your credible fear interview, we're going to send you back to Mexico and you're going to have to wait in Mexico until your hearing comes up. What that did was that discouraged a lot of these individuals because at the end of the day, the folks that are mostly coming from the Central American Northern Triangle countries, they want to be released into the United States. When they weren't getting what they were coming for under the Trump administration, they stopped coming. Under the Biden administration, the Biden administration is trying to terminate the migrant protection protocols, remain in Mexico policy. They're releasing those individuals into the United States And those illegal migrants are getting exactly what they want. They get to stay here in the United States, live and work here in the United States. So they're getting exactly what they're coming for. So that's why they keep coming in these massive, massive numbers. So, again, the Biden administration tried to terminate Trump's uh, Remain in Mexico program. The state of Texas, along with a number of other states, challenged the administration in court and said, whoa, you cannot end this program. The lower courts issued a temporary injunction forcing the Biden administration to keep Remain in Mexico in place. That was what the Supreme Court decision was based on. So it wasn't all bad news. What the Supreme Court essentially said is that we disagree with a lower court's temporary injunction stopping the administration from ending Remain in Mexico. The court cannot order the administration to end Remain in Mexico until the case is heard on its merits. So in other words, 
what the Supreme Court said is if the Biden administration wants to end Remain in Mexico today, they can. But there is still a pending court case on the merits with the Texas challenge and the other states that have joined Texas in this legal challenge. So now what they're doing is it's going back to the courts and the courts will now decide whether or not Remain in Mexico can stay in place or if the Biden administration can actually can actually lift it. So it doesn't mean that Texas has lost. They just lost on their desire to have a temporary injunction placed on the administration. So what's the timeline here? Because it seems like things are getting fairly dire yeah. in Texas and the, uh, the governor to, of Texas is looking for ways to really mitigate this problem in his state. The first question will be the question that you asked. Courts take a long time, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. So uh, this is going to get dragged out in the courts for quite a while. The administration, DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, has come out and said, it's uh, logistically, we can't really end remain in Mexico for another four months. But I do want to point out that the administration is not using remain in Mexico to its fullest extent. What the Trump administration did was everybody who crossed the border illegally and tried to claim asylum was subject to remain in Mexico and got sent out of the country, sent back to Mexico. But what the Biden administration is doing is they're picking and choosing who is actually eligible. And in most cases, it's single adult males who tend to be in like their upper teens and 20s. If they're an unaccompanied alien child or if they're a family unit, they are exempt from remain in Mexico and they're allowed to stay here. So it's only a very small percentage of the people who were eligible for remain in Mexico under Trump that are now still eligible under the Biden administration because of the tweaks that they made. But the court case will probably take at least six months to a year, if not longer, before this whole thing is hashed out. And and we're still hopeful that there will be a reasonable solution. But that there's also the possibility that, you know, Republicans take control of Congress in the fall and this gets so bad that Democrats join them in passing some sort of legislation that actually codifies remain in Mexico in the next Congress after that that occurs in January. Would there be any chance from your perspective that uh, President Biden would sign if that went through with a uh, bipartisan approach? That would be the the most obvious thing would be if if Biden just simply vetoed the legislation, um, which he could do if it were passed along a slim majority. But it would need 60 votes to pass in the Senate unless they were to attach it to something like, you know, right now the House of Representatives will be marking up this week the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, There are a couple of House Democrats that are trying to tweet, trying to to stick some immigration provisions into that must pass legislation. So that's one way that Republicans could get it done is they could flip it into a must pass and then Democrats go along with it. And that would require Biden to actually veto a huge major piece of legislation that's not necessarily related to immigration versus a standalone bill. If a standalone bill passed with a slim majority in the House, and even if it passed with exactly 60 votes in the Senate, I think that would still give him enough leeway, President Biden, that is, still give him enough leeway to veto the legislation. But if you saw, you know, maybe 65 votes and maybe close to 300 people voting for it in the House of Representatives, while not enough to overturn a veto, that would be a significant enough group of people voting for it that it could that could be enough to to convince Biden to sign the legislation. And there have been Democrats who have said we need to bring back Remain in Mexico, including Senators Kristen Sinema and Joe Manchin, as well as Henry Cuellar, a representative down in southern Texas. Tell me what the uh, the proposal is for the defense authorization bill. It seems like a stretch to be stuffing in something to do with immigration in there. So <laughs> what are they trying to accomplish? Yeah. <laughs> There were a number of immigration provisions that were that were stuck into the House version of of USICA, which is the anti-China trade bill uh, that's received some attention over the last six to nine months or so. This is a bill that 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 uh, Silicon Valley desperately wants because what it does is it invests its federal government investment in technology enhancements and improvements and entrepreneurship to help the United States compete better with the growing power of China. So this is something that, that the business community desperately wants and, and Republicans want it as well. The Senate passed a version that was solely focused on those technological, technological investments and innovation investments, um, but the House stuffed a number of immigration provisions into them, including things like 
allowing any foreign national who has the P- a PhD degree from a U.S. university or the equivalent from a foreign university to be able to get a green card in the United States exempt from any of our any, any of our numerical limitations. It looks like if USICA is actually able to pass through Congress, those immigration provisions that the House stuffed into it won't be in there. So now what we're seeing is we're seeing a couple of amendments on the NDAA side to get those approved. The two are the one that I just mentioned, which is to allow any foreign national with the equivalent of a Ph.D. degree to automatically get a green card here in the United States and be exempt from our numerical limitations. And then the second is to allow what they're calling adult dreamers. These are people who whose parents came to the United States legally on work permits. Their children were under the age of 18 when they came here. But what happens is once their child turns 18, they're no longer eligible to be connected to their parents' visa. So they become illegally present here in the United States, and it would offer them legal presence. Chris Jemolinski, how can people get more information on the work you're doing at Numbers USA? Sure, they can visit us at numbersusa.com. If they're not already part of our grassroots army, there will be a green button on the top left that says join us. They can fill out a form, send the message to Congress, and become part of our mailing list and our grassroots army. And we're on all the social media, uh, all the social media channels, twitter.com slash numbersusa, and also facebook.com slash numbersusa. It's very important work you're doing. Chris Chemolensky, thanks for joining us today on the Shilling Show Unleashed podcast. Thanks for having me. That concludes another edition of the Shilling Show Unleashed podcast. Visit us online at shillingshow.com where you can directly support this podcast by clicking on the Patreon banner at the top of the page and making a monthly donation. Your support is essential for the continuation of the Shilling Show Unleashed podcast. Until next time. Until next time.